Hello, welcome to the Friday, January 5th, 2018 edition of the Sands and the Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. The big news today, of course, were these CPU vulnerabilities that I briefly mentioned yesterday. Just after I recorded the podcast yesterday, the paper with all the details was released. I was still able to add the link to the show notes, but we now have a lot more detail than we had when I recorded yesterday. First of all, we do have names. Meltdown and Spectre are the two vulnerabilities that are responsible for all the frantic patching happening right now. Microsoft actually did release already the patch for the vulnerability. Originally was scheduled for Tuesday, but I guess with the release of the paper, they decided to release this patch early. Let me first focus on what really is new and important compared to what I told you yesterday. First of all, yes, there is a patch from Microsoft. Secondly, be careful applying that patch. There's more to it than a performance hit. Turns out that a number of antivirus products are incompatible with that patch. Symantec, for example, may cause a blue screen of death if you are patching a system first for Meltdown and you're not patching Symantec first. Most of the antivirus vendors have released up updates, but uh, make sure you apply the antivirus update first, then apply the patch for this vulnerability. I also mentioned yesterday that this vulnerability only affects Intel CPUs. That's only partially true. The underlying vulnerability is likely present in AMD and even in ARM CPUs. However, according to the papers, it hasn't been exploitable so far. So just a matter probably of someone to come up with the right trick to take advantage of this vulnerability. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, the difference between these two vulnerabilities. So what I described yesterday was pretty much the meltdown vulnerability. The meltdown vulnerability allows an attacker to read arbitrary memory, most importantly, kernel memory. So uh, this is essentially a privilege escalation vulnerability for an attacker that's able to execute code on a vulnerable machine. The second vulnerability, Spectre, is a little bit more focused in scope, but is still quite dangerous. It allows a reading of arbitrary memory in the current process. Now, you may say, hey, that shouldn't really be a big deal, but remember sandboxing. In particular, modern browsers implement sandboxing where JavaScript, for example, is allowed to execute, but not allowed to read arbitrary memory from your browser, like your browser history. With Spectre, uh, this may be possible and there are some practical exploits where JavaScript would be used to exploit Spectre. Spectre is also not really patched in any of the currently released patches for the operating system. However, some of the browser makers have come up with some countermeasures For example, they are now randomizing the timing of some of the execution or they're lowering the resolution of some of the timers that a user has access to with JavaScript in order to make it more difficult to exploit these vulnerabilities. And yes, there is a practical proof of concept exploit out there that does allow you to read arbitrary memory and take advantage of the meltdown vulnerability. So we are beyond the stage where we have to worry about whether or not someone will actually come up with an exploit. But with all the talk about these vulnerabilities, remember it's a privilege escalation vulnerability. It's not a remote code execution vulnerability. So you certainly don't have to rush out this patch today or tomorrow, in particular for your standard workstations where the user runs as administrator anyway. uh, There isn't really that much more an attacker can do with this vulnerability. They can't do already by just uh, attacking that particular user. The number one concern here are multi-tenant systems where you have multiple users that you may not necessarily trust uh, running code on the same CPU. So your public cloud environments are really ripe for exploitation here. All the big cloud providers have applied patches, so you should be okay there. 
Now, earlier today, Jake Williams uh, did a special webcast uh, for a sense uh, about this topic. I will add a link uh, to his webcast in the show notes. He goes into a lot more detail about how these exploits actually work. One thing he points out is that this may really just sort of be the tip of the iceberg. This is a somewhat new way to attack systems and uh, just a matter of time now for researchers to really sort of dig in on CPU architectures and see what other vulnerabilities may be buried in that code. Cloud environments will remain one of the big targets of these type of vulnerabilities because the CPU is the shared resource that all of these different virtual machines are using. So any kind of site channel or so, like in this case, that can be used to leak information across the CPU from one virtual machine, essentially one process to another process, can be used to either read data from other virtual machines or even from the host. So one thing to think about once you're done sort of with the emergency patching here is how are you going to sort of physically segment your virtual environments and how you're going to make sure that data of different classification is actually located on different hardware. This has always been sort of a guiding principle of sort of a sound virtual infrastructure. I remember back 10 years ago or so when Ed Scotus and Tom Liston were working on some of these virtual machine escape uh, attacks, that was sort of their guidance back then. So as I said yesterday, make sure you patch all of your shared systems, uh, your virtual hosts, and uh, be a little bit careful with the workstations when it comes to antivirus, also with your database servers and other systems that really have sort of a single user uh, payload and uh, have a lot of other mitigating controls around them are probably the ones that you wanna be a little bit more careful in particular since the performance hits may apply more to these types of systems then they apply to your normal workstation. Well, and that's really all for today. Should be enough to keep you busy on Friday. Remember, this month I still have the contest going. If you find a factual inaccuracy in this podcast, please drop me a note. And at the end of the month, I'll raffle off five Raspberry Pis. The assumption is that you'll use this Raspberry Pi as a sensor for the shield. Also, multiple submissions are okay as long as they do mention different inaccuracies. Thanks for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.